Well, hello, this is our review of chapter 10. Chapter 10 is completely new, written from scratch, and uh, completely new concepts. So, let's, uh, we have some arithmetic uh, to conquer, we have some cases to look at, and then we're going to talk, as is usual, about running the tests in the various software options. So, in chapter 9, we were looking at a for a large period to period change, and uh, we said that this, these could be symptoms for a higher risk of fraud or errors. Um, however, we compared two populations and we simply tested for the differences. It's almost as if we simply looked at two different Halloween bags of candy, last year's and this year's, and made a comparison. This is different. We are talking more about a longitudinal study here, and we're going to be using before and after concepts. So, what we need is a line item. You know, we have some examples, interest, revenues, the population of a country uh, or a county. It needs to have a value in the prior period and a value in the current period. Somebody's tax return, that would be, uh, we could put them side by side, and we would have numbers for one year, and we'd have numbers for another year. A set of financial statements, we could put them side by side, and in ca this case, it's a trial balance. We have 2019, 2020, we put them side to side, and we have a before and after value for each of these accounts over here. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to quantify the change from this period to that period, on the basis, again, that large changes could be symptoms of fraud or errors. Well, let's do a little bit of uh, matrix algebra. A matrix is a rectangular array of numbers, M rows, and N columns. Um, indeed, this is what most Excel spreadsheets look like. Uh, what we could have here is a set of grades for a semester, one row for each person, lots of columns for the various quizzes and tests and uh, presentations and the like. <clears throat> the entry in the i row and the j column is a i j. The fields each store one type of data, so these could be the test uh, results for test number three, and the rows hold all the data pertaining to an event or a transaction, or in that case, a student. Our purchasing card data is a matrix with that many rows and eight columns. And in those eight columns, we've seen the various uh, data, data types that we hold. We have lots of tables in a matrix format in accounting systems. Now, we're going to talk about a two-dimensional vector because I can graph in two dimensions. And the nice thing is I can graph and I can visualize in two dimensions and then I can simply change the arithmetic and do it in as many dimensions as I need. The arithmetic stays the same. I simply can't visualize it. So a vector is a matrix with one column. Well, we have two vectors here because we have two columns. Let's assume a taxpayer has a very simple tax return. In 2019, the numbers are revenue, net income. In 2020, the numbers are revenue, net income. Vector A extends from the origin, 0, 0, to the points 4, 3. Always X first. X and Y. The next one, vector B, and I only name them A and B because A comes before B in the alphabet. B goes from 0, 0 to 2.5, 1. So let's have a look. This is B. It goes from 0, 0 to 2.51, 2.5 on the x-axis, and 1 on the y-axis. This goes to 4, 3, 4 on the x, 3 on the y. Now, I can do a whole host of things. I can draw another vector from these two tips, and this tells me how different the, ve the vectors are. If this line was really short, it would tell me not much difference between those two vectors. If this line was really long, it would tell me there's a big difference there. I'm not sure what we'd call this. This would be somewhere between small and medium, uh, medium rare maybe. So what we're going to do is we're going to use C to measure how much 
A has changed when A went from A to B. So we can calculate the length. We're going to go back. I can calculate the length of A. That's no problem mathematically. I can calculate the length of B. I can calculate the length of C. We have these formulas over here talking about squaring and taking the square roots. And the length of A ends up as being 5, and the length of B ends up as 2.69. And if we look at these two lengths, you know, it does seem that this one is a little more than half as big as that one, which is what we get when we look over here. The length of C can be calculated as well. It might look daunting, but uh, let's have a look here. 2.5 minus 4 squared. There it is, 2.5 minus 4 squared. The next one was 1 minus 3 squared. We're simply doing squares and uh, square roots. Uh, 2.5 is the length of C. And indeed, C does look to be a little bit shorter than B. Now, we can also calculate the angle. The angle between these two vectors, now the arithmetic becomes a little more complicated. We have this uh, thing here, which is called the inverse cosine function. You know, we don't really have to remember any trigonometry. Uh, if we do the calculation in Excel, it'll do the arc cos function. And indeed, I can get the angle in radians, and the book talks about uh, what a radian is, but we can simply use Excel's degrees function and measure the angle in degrees. So when I do this, I get the answer of 0.2630. Then I convert the 2630 to degrees, and it tells me that angle is 15 degrees. And for my money, it looks right. Now, we are going to be measuring the score, uh, the change score. And all we are going to be doing is we're going to take the length of C and divide it by the length of A plus the length of B. When I have a small c, I have a small change. When I have a large c, I have a large change. So here it is. The vector variation score is the length of c divided by the length of a plus the length of b. Uh, this score is absolutely beautiful because it has a minimum value of 0 and a maximum value of 1. Um, if these two arrowheads are right on top of each other, C will have zero length, and indeed, my change will be zero. When C is at its maximum, this vector variation score will equal one. So I'm always going to have a, it's a normalized score. It's going to be between zero and one. If I simply looked at the length of C, for a big company, I would have a big C, and for a small company, I would have a small C. I want to know the change relative to the prior here. So, watch this. A really small C and a reasonably large A and B. Vector variation score, tiny. A medium. Here, here they're not exactly equal, but uh, let's just say they're close to being equal. I'll do C divided by A plus B, and I get a number just over a half. So this is my medium score, and the largest possible one would be, this is my C, these things are completely stretched here, like a, like a uh, gymnast. So what I could do at the limit, the C would equal A plus B, but I don't want to do that, and then you won't be able to see what's going on. So what I do is a C almost at its maximum, divided by A plus B, and I get the largest possible at 0.99. So, mathematically, this is how it works. These are my scores. Now, all I have to do is if I have something more complicated, my vector is not just, uh, doesn't only have two rows, but it could have 50,000, 100,000. There's no maximum in theory. Let's go to the purchasing car data. Remember the data, we had some event in 2012 that really caused us to spend a lot of extra money. And what we're doing now is I'm calculating the vector variation score between 2011, purchasing car data, and 2012. But I'm doing it on an agency by agency basis. So I'm getting the total.
total for each agency, putting it down here almost like a trial balance, putting it down here almost like a trial balance, but all the numbers are positive numbers. And now I'm calculating the change from here to there. These are the numbers. It's in the textbook. This is a large change or a medium, 0 0.572. This is large for what is normally found in financial data. The angle is 61.64 degrees. Why do we have this large change? Remember that storm? Well, let's go and look here. The Office of Contracting and Pro Procurement from 313,000 to 5.952 million. A massive change here. All the others are small potatoes as such. And the University of the District of Columbia suddenly fell off our radar and we had no records for 2012 and nearly 2 million over here. So these two changes drove most of this large score over here. And uh, the nice thing is the mathematics here told me that I have some large changes lurking and then I can go look for it and there they are. However, I don't really have to go look for it. I can calculate which row gave me the had the biggest influence on the vector variation score? I have a formula over here, and it tells me that the Office of Contracting and Procurement accounted for 88% of that vector variation score. This might look daunting, but um, the chapter has examples. So, where could we actually use this? Uh, this is an extract from a, a court document. Um, a transcript and the case dealt with identity theft tax refund fraud. This is where the fraudster creates a tax return in the name of a real person. They file that tax return. That tax return is fake but it is due a refund and what happens is the refund comes to them, they steal the refund and they keep the money. When the real taxpayer files his or her tax return, they then get some notification saying that they have already filed, and for them, a whole host of problems has simply started. The idea here was the prosecutor is uh, questioning the uh, IRS agent, and what he's trying to drive at is that the fraudster doesn't know what the previous year's tax return looked like. So... What they are doing in 2020 is they are simply guessing at numbers and they are guessing at numbers that are owed a tax refund. And my um, thoughts in the book are, wow, they're just guessing at the numbers. Maybe that would then have a large change from the prior year to the current year. My tax returns pretty much look the same year to year, but if somebody had to invent a tax return, now suddenly I would be showing a large change. And I say, yeah, the IRS could potentially use this vector variation score to identify tax returns with large year-on-year -year changes. And this could be one red flag that this is the, that the taxpayer is the victim of identity theft, tax refund fraud. Let's look at a case where a taxpayer should have had a large change, but the taxpayer didn't. In January 2000, Richard Hatch applied to be a contestant on the television show called Survivor. Survivor was filmed over six weeks from March to April of 2000. In August, the finale aired on CBS. He was paid 10000 for coming to the finale and he was paid $1 million for winning the competition. On August 18th, the company prepared two checks, one for 1,000 and one for 10,000. They sent him the checks. He got the checks. During the calendar year 2001, and it needs to be in, in the month of January, the company sent Hatch a Form 1099 MISC. Well, this is, on, this is a Form 1099 MISC, it's blank, but he would have had one with his details his social security number and the beautiful number of one million and ten thousand. 
In March, Hatch goes to an accounting firm and asks them to do his tax return. They do it. I assume Hatch didn't pay all that much by way of estimated taxes. They come out and they tell him that he owes 441000 in taxes, that much for taxes, and this much for interest and penalties because you're supposed to pay estimated payments as the year goes along. They meet him in November 2000, <clears throat> which is rather strange because the drop-dead filing date is October 15th. They meet him, they hand him the tax return, they say you owe 441000 he says, I will file, but he doesn't file. In December 2001, he hires another accountant. He gives uh, her his documents. He says that he owned a, a rental property. This is the rental property um, that was located, but he said he had no rental income. The new accountant prepares a new tax return, not knowing that he's had one prepared before. Um, he said that he had some management fees. I think it was a 20% commission to an agent and a 5% here. Uh, those numbers were apparently just made up. But she accepted them, prepared the tax return, and says, you owe the IRS 234000 I'm guessing that this tax return might have had nothing for interest and penalties, and the reason that I'm guessing that is because you can file without the interest and penalty number. And the IRS uh, will kindly, kindly, very kindly uh, calculate it for you. He said he would file. He didn't file. In the fall of 2002, remember this is the year 2000. So we are way late. Um, we are, we are, we should have filed by October 2001. It is now one year later, the fall of 2002. He asked the accountant what his tax liability would have been had he not received his survivor winnings. She prepares a tax return and said, if you didn't get that survivor money, you would have been due a refund of 4,483. By the way, what I'm showing you here is where the survivor money should have gone, on which line. However, this is an old tax return. Uh, they've changed the schedules now and um, they've updated where it should go, but it should go somewhere. She hands him the tax return that excludes survivor. She tells him it's for information and not to be filed. He agrees and says, this is for information is not to be filed. He took possession of the tax returns. He signed it and filed it. He left off. His tax return, uh, the tax return did not, that one did not declare any rental income for the year 2000. In December, he filed articles of incorporation for a non-profit charity called Horizon Bound. Well, this is because a company asked him to be a guest on the production of a pilot and that the television uh, um, program was called For Goodness Sake. He went on, they said they would donate 25000 to the charity of his choice. Hatch says, I know exactly the charity. That charity should be Horizon Bound. He might have left off the fact that, that was, he was sort of the owner or the director of that charity. The next year, he gets a job at WQSX FM in uh, Boston. A semi-monthly salary of 20000 833. That works out to $500,000 per year to host a morning show. I would love to be paid $500,000 to host a morning show. I would be the funniest morning show guy this side of the Mississippi because I would be thinking of my check every two weeks for $20,800. Well, they pay him his salary, but after a while, what he does is he says, I don't want to be paid as a person anymore. What I want to be paid is I want to be paid as a LLC corporation. And what they do is from April, they pay this LLC corporation, the rest of his salary, 326000 His career as a morning show ends December 7th, 2001. 
Hatch was the sole shareholder of this uh, S corporation. Uh, it earned 326000 He left it off his personal tax return, which is what you need to do, uh, which is what you not need to do. Uh, when you're the owner of a um, S corporation, that income needs to go on your tax return as well. In February, he got a Pontiac Buick, uh, uh, he got a Pontiac Aztec as part of the prize, valued at 27000 He left that off his 2001 tax return. There were a few other things, nothing uh, all that dramatic. Those are the sort of highlights. Well, charged with income tax evasion, went to court, and this is the jury verdict. Guilty. Income tax evasion for the year 2000. Guilty income tax evasion for the year 2001. Guilty signing a false tax return for the S Corporation. Not guilty. Wire fraud, wire fraud, mail fraud, mail fraud, mail fraud, mail fraud, bank fraud. Lucky, lucky, lucky. All of these offenses carry huge maximum sentences. But nevertheless, guilty over there. Imprisonment, 51 months. This is the federal courthouse where his trial was held. This was a Saturday afternoon, nothing to do with his case. And this was many years later. 51 months in prison, special conditions of supervision, mental health counseling, and he shall file amended tax returns for the year 2000 and 2001. Well, there's a bit more to this in the book. Read it. But that's sort of a nice summary of what happened. Let's compare Richard Hatch to Mike Sorrentino, known as The Situation. I think there is a big difference. Let's go back here. Uh, and in fact, what I have is one of the cases. This is case 17.3. This is the end of chapter material. This is what your instructor will give you. And what I say here, on October 9th, Sorrentino was sentenced to eight months in prison and two years of uh, supervised release for income tax evasion at the federal level. Read the indictment and answer the questions that follow. Let's have a look over here. We can go back here. Sorrentino did not file a tax return for 2010 to 2012, three years. Did not declare approximately $8.9 million in income. Over a three-year period, $8.9 million. Compare that to Richard Hatch, uh, evaded tax on approximately $1.5 million. Um, Richard Hatch, 51 months. Mike Sorrentino eight months. So uh, there's more to it. Um, you can read the um, read the indictment. And I think what I'll do is I will put this indictment in the uh, Dropbox folder as well. So Sorrentino, 8.9 million, eight months. What I do in the book as well is I show as an example for this vector variation score, what happens with Joe Biden. You can see Joe Biden is vice president of the United States of America and he's vice president in the year 2016, if I remember correctly. Net income, 396,000. Goodbye, vice president. Hello, normal citizen. Um, book deal, a nice uh, jump in income, $11 million adjusted gross income in the year after being vice president. So the result was a vector variation score of 0.966, which is near the maximum possible, a large angle, 85 degrees. And indeed, it's true. The vector variation score did its job. It told us that there was a large change from here to here. We can see it and we know it. And we know that it is because of a complete change in circumstances and absolutely nothing to do with fraud or 
tax evasion. I don't want to. I don't want any illusions here. I simply chose it because he's a public figure, and we know he had a large change in circumstances, and we can actually see that mathematically here as well. These are the calculations um, being done, and you can see that it's nothing too dramatic. We have the vector lengths over here, and just below uh, we have the Excel calculations, and that might take up another six or seven lines. So this can be rather easily done in Excel. In the chapter, I talk about various options that we have for calculating this. This can be easily done in Excel, SAS, Access, and even R. I like this chapter, but it's time to summarize. The score quantifies the period-to-period -period difference between two financial data sets. It's based on a distance metric. The score has a range of 0 to 1, where a score of 0 means no change, and 1 means an extreme difference. We can quantify how much each line contributed to the score. I demonstrated the score on 2011 and 2012 purchasing uh, data. And indeed, it showed a large score, and it showed us which agencies had large swings. And I want to stress that those two facts were not immediately obvious when we looked at the descriptive statistics in the previous chapter, or when we looked at the high-level overview tests in chapter number two. I believe external auditors could use the score in the planning stage of the audit Two, compare the closing trial balance in the current year to its counterpart in the prior year, and this would give us a feel for how much things have changed, and the bigger the change, I submit, the bigger the risk. I've enjoyed this chapter. I hope you enjoyed the review.